Hi everyone, I'm Dar Shah, Audit Partner at Blick Rothenberg. I'm here with Justin Jeffrey, Director at Mini Spares, and we're here to shoot the latest episode of our client success stories. So Justin, what is Mini Spares? So we are a, a global supplier of classic Mini Spares. So that's any, any car that was uh, built between 1959 and 2000. So anything that was BMC or Rover, and I, I would express that uh, we don't supply anything with the current BMW Mini. So it's any, any classic Mini before 2000. What's the Mini Spares story? And what's the history of the company since, especially since when you joined? The, the company started, as we say, in 1975. Founder Keith had a, had a passion for minis. He was working at a main dealer at the time, and he was in charge of MGB, believe it or not. But he could see that the marketplace for mini was, was much larger. It was a mass-produced car. So uh, he decided, or he went to speak to his, his employers and said, look, I think we need to specialise. We need, we need specialist knowledge in mini, MGB, and, and I'd like to do mini. They said no. He said, fine, I'll do it by myself. And, and, and that's, what he, that's what he did. We, we grew from a very small, you know, one man band, which he, which he worked tirelessly at. And when I joined the firm in the, in the middle of the 80s, I think there was about seven or eight members of staff. And as you say, it was a traditional mail order company. We had, walk -in, we had a lot of walk in trade in those days because people who had a mini, it was a, it was a cheap form of transport and they did whatever they could do to keep them on the road. So we had very knowledgeable staff and Keith passed his knowledge down to the, to the, cust you know, the trade staff that we had. And they worked on the counter and they answered the phone. We were a traditional mail order company and we had a fax machine, <laughs> people remember those, a telex machine. And we had, we had the phone um, ordering. So people would ring up, place an order. We'd run around the warehouse, which at that point was about 5,000 square feet pack the stuff up and, and, and send it off. From that we grew and grew. We had a, an international market that was, was only trade customers at that point. So we, had, we, had, we didn't have any retail international trade. It was, it was only businesses that were buying from us and selling on. I, I joined the firm fully, um, not as a schoolboy back in 1988. And even then we were computerized. So we had a computer system, stock control, sales system. And that really, that interested me to try and develop that right. as much as we could. In the in the early 90s, mid 90s, we had a really good customer in, in the US and California who was based right in Silicon Valley. And his son said to me, you need to have a website. So well, I've never heard of a website. This is before Google. <laughs> before Google, before, before any of that stuff was kind of, you know, mainstream. I said, fine, you know, yeah, we'll have a, we'll have a website. And suddenly we were getting inquiries from uh, all over the world from people wanting to buy minis because minis during their production were produced in, in Brazil, in Australia, all over the world. So every corner of the world had um, had minis, and people were passionate about them. You know, it's a passionate it's a passionate business what we do. So that side of our, our business really grew very very quickly. And then in 1999, we'd we'd outgrown that old Victorian <laughs> shop that we were in, and we moved into these 37,000 square foot premises that we're we're in now. And the journey continues. You successful the company successfully bought the warehouse last year. Yep, absolutely. And you're obviously looking to hopefully growing yeah yeah i mean part part of that growth we we opened a, a, a store in york or well, actually first started in in harrogate and then we moved to york in 2015 and that's a that's that's a major part of our success because they handle a lot of the uk mail order so we kind of split the the businesses up so they handle the uk side and we handle the international and the trade side from here so yeah uh, that, that part of our growth has, has been exponential really since we became more of a mail order company really than a... So a obviously started domestic market, near shore, and then offshore, international global presence, I believe you're in 120 countries. Yep. Um, that's where you make sure the mini parts are delivered. Yep. All ordered on uh, your website. Um, yet you still have a walk-in presence. You, mm -hmm. you know, there's, a, there's still a shop. You yep. still have customers walking in even yeah. uh, constantly throughout the day. Yeah. Why? I think it's really important to keep in in contact with our loyal customer base. And a lot of customers come here not just to pick up parts, but to get knowledge. And uh, Gary, Gary, who's the face of Mini Spares, anybody that's come to Mini Spares will know of Gary. He's been with us since 1985. So he's, he's, there's not much he doesn't know about a Mini. He, he passes that on to other people that work with us. And a lot of people come from overseas just to visit Mini Spares. 
you know, we're, we're lo where we're located just outside London, a lot of people come to London, they'll come on the train to Potter's Bar, come into the shop, we show them around and uh, pack up their suitcases and off they go. And that's a really, it's a really important part for us to make sure that we, you know, keep in contact with our customers, know what's going on and, and can supply parts quickly when people need them. So it's not just selling the parts, but it's also sharing the knowledge. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Way back in the, in the early days when we started with the, with the website and cataloging, Mini's gone through, you know, 1959 was a Mark I, and then you went Mark II, Mark III, Mark IV, and there's lots of variants. We've got a, 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 a Countryman here, we've, yep. got, we've got Mark I here, we've got lots of, lots of different variants, and it's important for, for the staff here to know what those change points are, because if someone comes in and says they've got a 1962 Mini and they need a top hose, they need to know what hose fits that rather than a, a late 2000. So uh, that knowledge and cataloging and, and that side of things is really, is really important to us. Who are your typical customers? Uh, anything. We've got, we've got 13 year old boys who want their first car to be a Mini. So they've convinced their dad to go and buy one and they're going to do it up over the next five years. We've got 80 year old customers who's still got their first car that they bought brand new and they're still driving it. We've got racers, we've got everything in between. It, it really is a diverse customer base. Justin, why do you like classic minis? I think probably the best thing to do is take you out in one and let you, let you experience it. Yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> That'd be great. Well, it's, they're iconic. You know, it's an iconic British mark that has stood the test of time, you know, 1959 to 2000. They made over five and a half million cars during the production runs. And every single one of them is unique. Every customer that buys one makes it their own. They, they change things, they paint things, they work on it. And you can still work on it with your dad on your drive. You know, that's the, that's the beauty of them. A lot of our customers come in, maybe bought one, as a cheap form of transport and it was their dad's first car and he thinks wow well, you know I need to buy myself another Mini and they're just great little cars they're great fun to drive they are ridiculously small on a, on a current road if you drive if you drive around the M25 in one of these things lots of people look at you lots of people give you the thumbs up and it just it just really puts a smile on, on your face when you drive one Obviously, we touched upon um, how the company has continued to be relevant in spite of being in a very niche market and the company has grown in all those years. But what challenges have you faced in its growth? So if you, if you go back to the, to the early days when Rover was still producing the car and we were, that's where the majority of our product came from. So supply of product was quite easy. We went on, the, uh, went on, <laughs> went on a Telex machine every day sent the order across the next day the parts would be delivered once rover stopped producing the car and, and the parts became harder and harder to find we had to resource those parts or remanufacture those parts so that's been a major factor that we've had to overcome you know a, a car is made up of thousands and thousands of components and without one of those components the car will, will die so um, we have to choose which components and which parts that we're going to remanufacture we put them in a great big long list from must do's to would like to do's and we we pick those off as, as as we can the challenge has been to find the right suppliers suppliers that you can trust and are are going to be cost effective to do and as, as we said you know the uk manufacturing um, industry went away for a while but it's coming back and we've we've, we've got wherever we can we try and source stuff in the uk but globally as well and we've got some really good suppliers in the UK supply trim and bright work all the, all the grills and the bumpers and all those parts are made in the UK a lot of the gearbox parts are made in the UK so wherever we can we continue to source either from the original manufacturer believe it or not and they're still around a lot of those people or if we have to retool and, and, and go overseas we do that but that's that's a real challenge to find to partner up with the right people and make sure that you've got the right suppliers. And over the years, we found some really, really good ones and we're very lucky. How easy was it to move from the domestic market to selling uh, globally? It was a challenge. Get, getting products to the customer in, in the early days was, was difficult. And that's why we concentrated on the trade customer because it, it was lots of containers and that was quite easy to do. When, it, when, we, when we got into the retail market, it becomes a lot more difficult 
There's lots of paperwork involved. And over the years, since the, the late 80s till now, logistics companies are uh, they're far better at it now than, than they used to be. But there was a lot of paperwork involved and a lot of time. It was quite con- time consuming, filling out customs forms and all that sort of stuff. Then we, uh, when we went into the EU, it was brilliant. That all went away. And uh, now we're not in the EU anymore. <laughs> so it's yeah, now so got, got full circle and now it's really difficult again. So yeah, that's the, hence the next question. Uh, Brexit and other international events that have, you know, um, that have occurred, how has that affected the company? Well, pre-Brexit, 50% of our retail international business was in Europe. And it was, it was easy. You, I could get a parcel to France or Germany the next day. It Correct. Was, it yeah. was, I think people forgot about the time before, you know, when you had to fill out paperwork and everything else. And it just became really, really easy. Brexit has really knocked our retail business, especially in Europe. It's too expensive. It's too timely. It's... It's really difficult to get parcels into the into Europe now, and for our customers as well, they, they don't know what their end cost is going to be. So that's a real challenge for us. We're lucky that we've picked up our, and we've always had a really strong trade customer base in Europe. France is our, our biggest export company uh, country, so that's we're really lucky that we've got those people to fall back on, and they're supplying our product to the end user. I hope in the future that we can get back to some retail trade in Europe, but uh, it's difficult. So obviously you successfully replaced uh, the retail uh, customer base with the trade customer base. So they must have had an impact on margins. Yeah, margins have really been hit. Yeah, Yeah. it's slightly easier to send five big boxes of stuff than lots of tiny little boxes. But yeah, the margins have been impacted. Do you just replace it with volume? Yeah, basically. Yeah, that's where we try and we try and keep. What advice would you give other companies that have a desire to expand beyond the domestic market to international market? I think the key, key thing is a good relationship to a logistics company. We work mainly with DHL, who are great. They've had their challenges through, <laughs> through Brexit, and sometimes they've not been as helpful as I think they could have been. On the whole, we've got a really good relationship with them. And, and very important for a mail order company, certainly for in an export market, that customer, the first time they ever have any experience of you as a company is when your, your parcel is delivered to their door. Yeah. And if that's a bad experience, it reflects badly on you as, a, as, as their supplier, as, the, as their, uh, cust- you know, as you as the supplier. So if the box is delayed or it's damaged or it doesn't get there or whatever, you know, there can be a hundred reasons for that. Go wrong, yeah. that are, out of our hand completely you know when, once we've packed that box and we've put it on the back of a DHL lorry we have we can we can do very little from that point to af- basically affect what happens so having a key relationship with a with a a good logistics company is really key to export and information if you whatever information you can have on your website and make it as easy as possible for them to order and as and as transparent as possible so that they know that when they get the parcel they're not going to be hit with surcharges customs clearance and all those kind of things and that's brexit has not helped, helped in that but the rest of the world you know we've got down pat now so we can we can supply parcels as you say 2000 uh, last year we, we supplied 122 different countries in uh, in the world so it's it's pretty unique, really, that yeah. minis have made their way to that many, <laughs> that many countries. That's right. In spite of being in a very niche market, yep. the company has continued to be extremely relevant and it's just grown. The figures have demonstrated over the years. Um, what do you think is the, the, the key reason for this success? I think lo- lots of factors, really. Classic cars have had a real resurgence in the last... 10, 15 years, and certainly in the UK and, and around, around the world. And it's a, it's a passion market. Uh, people are passionate about it. So uh, you tend to find what's needed for your passion, be it whatever it might be. So I think that's, that's helped us. As a, as a business, we've, we've retained really good staff, which is, has been key to, key to our success, I think. Most of, most of the sales staff be, have been here 15 plus years. Warehouse staff, we've got some warehouse staff that go back to the 80s as well. So re- retaining staff and, and their knowledge, you know, as, we, as we've already touched on, knowledge is a key part of what we do. We have people ring up from the States that say they've got a 
Mark I Cooper S and they send us a picture and it's a late Mark V car right. with, you know, with a radio and air conditioning, which uh, having the knowledge to tell them that they haven't actually got what they think they've got, giving them the right parts is key. Because again, it goes back to that customer experience. The first time they experience anything about us as a company is when the box arrives. And if the parts that are in the box are not right, it's a negative experience. So you've got to make sure that you've, you've got the knowledge in the background to make sure they get the, what they want. And obviously you hold the stock as well. Stock is key, especially in, in today's marketplace. I always say if we haven't got it in stock, you can't sell it. So our stock holding has increased and increased. And with the demise of the UK manufacturing industry, we've had to go over overseas and, and source our stuff globally. And therefore you've got to buy it in bigger volumes. Um, as the economy is a scale, you can't ship little boxes. You've got to you know, you've got to ship containers. And again, that, that development, putting all of our money back into stock and back into re development of new products and new parts is, is again, key to our success, I think. What advice would you give uh, to yourself uh, if you had to go back 10 years? So th I think I would try and spend as much time as possible in every area of the business. When I started, there was only set so seven people, so everyone did everything. You answered the phone, you picked the parts, you packed the parts, you did everything. As we've grown, that's, that's impossible to do. We've got specialist pickers, we've got specialist packers. But my advice would be spend as much time as possible in every area of your business so that you can understand it. And if there's a problem there, you know how to fix it. Justin, over the years, obviously, I've, we've worked together uh, for quite a while now. And I know how much value you put in uh, your strategic partners. Um, what do you look for in your advisors? Special, specialist knowledge, again, goes back to what we do. We are, we are a specialist supplier of mini spares. So if we've got an issue with tax planning or distance selling, and I think, you know, way back early on in our relationship, we had, right. we had a big issue with distance selling, That's and right. uh, you found us a, a, a good partner to, uh, to deal with those problems. So really, it's finding the right people for the right job and not wasting Time is precious when, you, when, you, when you're running a business and you've got lots of staff, time is precious. And you, you, if you're spending time on a project, you want to make sure that it's time well spent and you don't want to go back and revisit it. So having the right advice and pointing you in the right direction is key. And thankfully, you've, you've done that quite well over the years. <laughs> Grateful. I know you've had, um, obviously, you've had uh, succession, succession planning yep. to deal with over the last few years. And... There were some um, challenges over that, uh, quite an emotive uh, subject yep. to deal with. Um, do you think as directors and shareholders you're all in the right place now? Yeah, absolutely. Any family business, anyone who runs a, or, or works in a family business will tell you it's, it's, it can be very emotive at times and you very rarely get to leave work behind and you know, go home. My brother-in-law is, is a director, my wife works here, so it's... Yeah, it's, it's all encompassing. And I think over the last few years with succession planning and the things that we wanted, where we wanted to get to, and also important for Keith as the founder to leave things where he wants them to be. And I think we found a really happy balance there. So yeah, that's, yeah, it's key. So what's next for Mini Spares? Continue to grow. You know, I'm, I'm, amazed, I'm continually amazed that we grow year on year. When you think that the car finished production 20, 23 years ago, yeah. there's still cars that are being found in barns and in garages. And that's again, the beauty of the Mini. It's a small car. You can hide it away in the back of a garage and think, oh, one day I'm gonna, I'll get to that one day. And then one day comes and, and people have, as I said, you know, it's a passion market. People love their cars and they restore them and sell them on. And the next customer who buys that car they don't like those wheels, they want to change them to something else. They don't like the bumper, they change it to something else. So it's a continually, you know, every Mini that changes hands turns into that person's own car and they can customise it as they want, which is again the beauty of it. Justin, thank you for your time today and being part of our client success stories. Um, it's been a lovely day. Thank you. Thanks.